What is up, YouTube? Welcome back to Stacks at Bay the Numbers. Today is, uh, what's today? Friday. And it's about midday here. It's about one in the afternoon. But I wanted to do an overall analysis on a company that I don't know if a lot of you are familiar with. There's a petrochemical company based out of South America. And someone just asked me to take a look at it. So let's do a quick little overview here of Brascom, South America, ticker symbol BAK, uh, here listed in the States on the New York Stock Exchange. And as we see right now, stock trading $8.49, up 16 cents, just about 2% here on the day. This is a company recently, you know, they've done some collabs, as you see. Ah, oh, my apologies, Steam friend. But as you see, uh, collabs here with Shell. But recently, you can see the S&P cut uh, Brazil's petrochemical firm, Brascom, to junk. And also, I believe, uh, Moody's or Fitch. Um, so here we go. Brascom rating cut by Fitch on perceived increase in ESG risk. But let's see if the company is potentially undervalued or if we're dealing with a value trap. Now, first of all, I'm not trying to beat the company up. Could be a decent company. But I just want to say, in my opinion, um, I personally never looked for companies like this. Uh, unfortunately, out of South America, we see there's a lot of nationalization that can take place, especially when we're talking about, you know, chemical companies, oil companies. That's why one that's similar in the space is a company called Petrobras, which is a state-run oil company. So that's what nationalization means. So that's why, in my opinion, I just personally kind of stayed away from these stocks. But hey, I mean, it's a publicly traded company, and if you can get in and make money off of it, then why not, right? So let's see what's going on. So Brascom right here, we have a market cap of about three and a third billion. The company's losing a little over $2 a share. The beta is slightly over one. Again, the beta is the overall volatility of the stock in relation to the overall volatility of the market. The problem with this company, in my opinion, is first of all, revenue has been slightly dipping, but more importantly, it's the bleeding here and the widening of the losses that we're seeing over the last couple of quarters, which in my opinion is just adding to the momentous sell-off over the last uh, couple of years, actually. But as you see here, missing on the EPS side, three of the last four quarters, big wider miss last quarter but even before that you can see coming in losing 40 cents on estimates of 31 here they actually went positive posted nine cents on an estimate loss of uh, 13 cents and the quarter before that you can see almost doubling the loss here estimates were a loss of 46 cents they post a loss of 86 cents so we can see that the company is struggling a little bit and recently you can see that we used to do four, five plus billion a quarter in revenue, and now we've slightly begun ticking down. Now, granted, one positive that the company has shown us is that in the last couple of years, the revenue did chunk up after that 2020 mess. However, again, for, for the year-over-year -year growth, is it's actually decreasing. But we can see here again, <clears throat> excuse me, 484 billion for the quarter down to 361 back up to 375 down to sub 36 last quarter 3.42 billion and we can see also obviously the net margin percentage is sitting here widely negative here went slightly positive here for q1 and was negative before and and since but if we switch over here annually you can see look at this company here back 2018 almost 16 billion in revenue down to 13, down to 11, and then explodes up to 19.5 billion. And then the year after, a little less than 18.7 billion. And now for 2023, earnings coming out on this company Monday after market close. And uh, I think if we add those up, this to the last three previous quarters, I think we're, about, we're around 14 billion and change, which is right around what the company was forecasting for their estimates. So. We, we could potentially come in lighter than expected for the full fiscal year of 2023, but I know people sometimes, they, they try to, we try to take shortcuts, right? Because we just want the information, right? Come on, give me the symbol. Is it a buy? Is it a sell? Come on, let's go. Let's get this train moving. And I can appreciate that. But again, like I always say, when it comes to these investments, and even when it comes to trades as well, you get out what you put in. And, you know, e even all of my short-term swing traders, my option traders out there, you know as well as I do, you can't really just look at one thing. 
even if you pull up a chart and you see a potential uh, pattern forming, let's just say, you, you know, you have like a descending wedge that's been lining up for the last week or two, you and I both know you still have to check under I other indicators, right? You, you have to first wait for the confirmation on the breakout technically if you want to react and not predict. And also, you have to make sure that the volume is coming in to confirm said breakout, right? You may want to check the RSI as well to see how that's holding up and is it lining up with that low 30, potentially sub 30 benchmark as you approach the apex of that wedge, right? This is what I mean when I talk about the perfect storm. Do we have like a list of these technical indicators that are all lining up the same way, showing us that this stock is potentially ready to pop in the near short term. So, you know, hypothetically, we're going to step in with some calls and we're going to catch a nice pop and make a nice return. But on the investment side, if you're talking about long term investments, you're looking for a stock to hold for the next 12 months, 18 months, five years, whatever it is, the, the more you put in, the more you get out. So uh, uh, basically, my original point was just going back to I know that myself personally, one of the few things I look at is how much revenue the company is bringing in and what's the current market cap of the company. And it's unfortunate because a lot of people will just throw symbols at me and and just kind of suggest, oh, you should look at this one. You, you know, you'd probably like it. The revenue is, you know, X and, and the market cap's all the way down here at Y. So that means it's undervalued, right? Well, it, it could be. But also at the same time, a lot of the stocks we looked at where, in my opinion, the market cap wasn't correctly representing the revenue coming in, it was still, for the most part, uh, you know, a growing situation that had more positivity to come in, in the future, which is why as it got beaten up and it maybe didn't make sense in the numbers, that's when you would buy that dip of a quote unquote undervalued stock and then ride the wave back up. The difference here is Brascom has been dealing with uh, some negative issues and again on the earnings side has been pretty inconsistent. So again the last couple of quarters revenue kind of ticked down again sub three and a half billion. We dropped negatively here on the net margin. You can see lowest it's been the last couple of quarters minus 14 and a half percent losing 500 million for last quarter here, Q3. But first of all, let's see what the analysts have to say real quick. We can see that we have nine analysts currently covering this situation. Three are giving it a strong buy, six are giving it a hold. Average price target here at about 11 and a half, stock right now at eight and a half, and pretty much every price target is above the current level. If we look on the EPS side though, we can see the company only beat two of the last eight quarters and basically consistently misses and posts wider than expected losses for the most part. If we switch over annually, we can see that going all the way back to 2015, this company has not beaten on a fiscal year EPS estimate in seven years. Well, potentially, but we can see also just look quarter over quarter. You can see the steady decline, the steady decrease for this Q4 coming in these earnings on Monday companies forecasting 3.3, excuse me, analysts are forecasting 3.36 billion for the quarter. And then you can see moving forward, we have a slight tick back up to three and a half, and then we dip back down, 344, 337. So the slight pullback of revenue is is suspected to continue and stay here at about this three and a half billion and sub mark for the next couple of quarters. If we look over annually too, we can see, you know, they have been bouncing around. And even though these numbers do change, we had the slight dip here in 2019 below 10 billion, but before and after that, the company was maintaining this 10 billion plus mark in revenue and even eclipsing 20 billion here in 2021. So we know there's some value here and there's some necessity here, right? This is a company, again, petro petrochemical company, and, um, you know, it's used for like, uh, if you go to their website, they show you, you know, they have like, like the stretch film and the cling film that like goes over like produce and meat products in the supermarkets and whatnot. Obviously, we know that when you're dealing with these oil companies and, and we yield all of these uh, plastic byproducts, we know that they're used in a slew of consumer goods. So we know that these companies are a necessity. But again, in my opinion, the main issue 
that that I'm seeing here personally is that unfortunately the company again based out of South America and in my opinion I just feel like there's always that fear of nationalization and I, I just feel like the, the people who always get screwed over are the shareholders and sometimes in the numbers it doesn't make sense but unfortunately it is what it is but we can also see here that the company was paying a dividend in 2018 and then kind of cut it and then we can see in 21 we have a dividend and then they cut it so we do have some inconsistencies here we can see over the years the debt was sub 10 billion back in 2018 rose up to 11 11 6, 4, down to 9 7 back up to north of 10 however if we look quarterly we can see we have a little bit of a different story here throughout 2023 because back here the second half of 22 you can see debt about 10 and a quarter billion then slight dip down to 1019 billion then back up to 106 then 1072 and that was of last quarter 11.48 so we chunked up several hundreds of millions of dollars in debt just from q2 to q3 now i understand these companies they take on debt to accumulate you know more assets or whatever the heck they need to do i understand all that but obviously again as the revenue is dipping down and the losses are widening we're also having an increase in debt so in my opinion i i do have to view that as a negative you can see free cash flow here in the middle one little over a quarter of a billion down to 154 then we go big negative here to start 2023 minus 764 million we'll call it then we go back positive 194 million now as of last quarter we're back negative again on the cash flow minus 737 million so obviously in my opinion that seems to be struggling a little bit however the cash for the most part does seem to be slowly ticking higher we can see here 217 billion up to 236 billion 244 274 and then as of last quarter just a tiny dip down to 272 so the company's holding a couple billion dollars cash on hand we have assets outweighing liabilities here in the short term opposite here in the in the longer term but we can see here the cash from the operating activities themselves again two of the last three quarters here throughout 2023 dipped down negative forcing negative free cash flow again technically it's a negative but i mean we know that some of these numbers fluctuate sometimes for these companies so i uh i don't know if if, if we can completely beat the company up for that but i will say here looking at the assets to liabilities we can see that the assets really dip down here from about 18 and a third billion all the way down to 16 6 billion and the last couple of quarters now have recently made a comeback and we've gotten back above that 18 billion mark so we're slightly higher than where we were back here q1 of 22. the problem though is the liabilities have outpaced our growth in assets right so we're back basically to where we were a little bit higher in q1 of 22 but you can see the liabilities down here about 16.1 billion dip down to about 15 and a half and now the last couple of quarters again throughout 2023 seems the company's really struggling a little bit here throughout this year and uh, we can see that liabilities now up to about 17 and a half billion and of course assets minus liabilities yields total equity and we can see that basically for the most part the equity has been dipping down you had the jump back up here to 14 billion and now as of last quarter again with the liabilities increasing we now have equity of less than 1 billion and as i said the drop down in equity would usually yield a lower book value per share and you can see here that back here q122 when we were back at this 18 plus billion asset mark we had a book value of six dollars and 13 cents and you can see that we've basically consistently been stepping down we had a nice bump up here 348 388 and then we resume that step down 376 as of last quarter book value 252 now granted these numbers are decreasing and some of these metrics could be viewed as negative however the company right now trading you know a little over three times book value not necessarily the best metric to use in my opinion because we've seen crappy companies trading like 14 times book value however more importantly in my opinion is the fact that it seems to be steadily decreasing not necessarily looking at the price to book ratio looking at the book value itself slowly dropping down so in my opinion i'm viewing that as a negative 
obviously the revenue has been decreasing the cost of goods pretty much in line because again obviously you know as as the revenue steps down the cost of goods steps down as well uh total revenue minus cost of goods sold yields gross profit we can see we were doing high hundred millions almost a billion here back in q1 of 22 then we dropped down to about half that went negative clawed back positive dropped about 50 percent from that point and now we had a slight tick up here last quarter quarter over quarter on the gross profit so that seems to be slowly you know trending in the right direction potentially starting to make that u-turn maybe uh, operating expenses, 240, you know, basically appear to be in line. Uh, gross profit minus operating expenses yields operating income. And you can see the operating income again, the, you know, obviously they were doing much better back here, the earlier part of 22. And you can see the operating income, 700 million, down to a little below 600 million. And then we drop hard to 176 million. And then we go negative several hundred million. Had a nice little rebound here to only minus 40 million. And then started to trend back downward minus 143. As of last quarter, slight tick up, but still negative sitting here at about 125 million. So this is why some of these metrics, especially when you go from positivity back to negativity, that in my opinion, just... I, I feel like that triggers the short sellers to just come out of the woodwork and all of a sudden they start hitting the stock like crazy. So going from positive to negative and basically staying there now consistently, in my opinion, I think, you know, so, some of these fundamentals specifically are, are the reasons why the stock is being held down. Of course, again, there were also some other issues where we're going to talk about their salt mine, but I just wanted to show you guys some of these numbers here. And uh, again, we don't have a PE because we have a negative EPS. Price to sales, 0.23. Okay, I guess that's kind of in line. As you can see, we were trading at a, at a better multiple here back in 22. There is no cash flow. Price to book, about three and a third. Again, not necessarily a crazy multiple, a ratio. But as you see... We, we are technically trading at the highest book uh, price to book ratio here going back the last seven quarters or so. The enterprise value, interestingly enough, <clears throat> enterprise value is uh, essentially how much another company would be willing to pay for this company. And as you see, the enterprise value is sitting here at a touch below 11 billion. And the market cap right now is three and a third billion. So the enterprise value is a little over 200% higher than the current market cap of the company but we can see our return percentages drop back down negative gross margin was up here in the high teens drops down negative gets back to single digits drops to 258 as of last quarter back up to 341 so technically that's up quarter over quarter operating margin was positive double digits drops down to negative uh, rebounds to minus one, drops back down to minus four as of last quarter, minus three, six, nine. So technically that's up a little bit quarter over quarter. EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. We can see we're sitting here in the mid to high teens, drops down to about half of that and then falls down negative. Has a nice rebound back up to north of 5%, drops down to three and a third as of last quarter, back up slightly above four. So that technically as well is up slightly quarter over quarter. Net margin we looked at before, we can see that we were positive here about 14.5%. Dip down negative, reclaim positivity, and then chunk back down. And now we're negative about 14.5%. Uh, inventory turnover was climbing up here from the low fives to the sixes. Last couple of quarters though seems to be slowly stepping up here. 507, 508, 531. The problem, I think, in my opinion, is the debt. I think it's recent headlines. And I think, again, uh, the, just the fact that the dip in revenue has now caused a lot of these margins to drop down and go from positive to negative. I just think that, in my opinion, it seems like, as of right now in the numbers, 
that we have a lot more red flags than green flags, in my opinion. The asset turnover, again, technically, basically how much revenue the company is able to generate off of said assets that it's holding. And as you see here, the asset turnover was sitting here at 118, dipped down to 117, and even 112. And in my opinion, I really wouldn't have big concerns there. But then it's the con continued drop down here to sub 1, down to 0.88, now as of last quarter, 0.81. So it doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you compare these current numbers back to where they were uh, roughly 18 months ago, you can see that a lot of these metrics are down a huge chunk here, going from 118 to 0.81, it's about a 30% drop. So this is why I'm saying, in my opinion, just personally here, from what I'm seeing, it looks like, it looks like we're dealing with more negatives than positives. The debt, again, the debt has been climbing, and the assets have recently just rebounded but as the debt increases and some of these numbers potentially stay the same what happens is our debt ratios now begin to go higher which technically a lot of people will will attest to the fact that that technically on paper is a negative and we can see the debt to assets was down here 0.55 climbs up to 0.61 slowly ticks down and then climbs back up to 0.62 as of last quarter our debt to equity ratio was down here at four and just has been consistently climbing for the most part. You had the slight dip here and then it just immediately went back to climbing going from a little over four. Now as of last quarter, 11.44 debt to equity ratio. So this is why, again, when we see some metrics like this consistently decreasing and looking worse than they did several quarters back, this is why, in my opinion, uh, again, the short sellers come out of the woodwork and they'll try to hit the stock. Uh, the one thing that I'm very curious to see is, as you see here, minus this last quarter, you can see the company only missed two of the last seven quarters here on the revenue side. And now even though revenue has been ticking down, we can see for last quarter estimates were all the way down at $3 billion and the company posed $3.39 billion, coming in above those estimates by over 13%. So, in my opinion, of course, it's an earnings play, and we know earnings are a gamble, so please understand the risks involved. Anything can happen. But I'm very curious to see what this revenue number is that they post. Because if they're somehow able to come in again much higher above analyst expectations and come in, you know, 7, 8, 10% above this number, then we could potentially have a reversal taking place and the stock could potentially pop out and break out and maybe get back to that double digit, maybe low 10s if possible. But of course, again, earnings kind of unpredictable. So what we're going to have to wait and see. And in my opinion, with this company, I would probably be in wait and see mode. If I had to take a position going into these earnings, based on what I'm seeing right now, in my opinion, I would probably lean more towards the put side as opposed to the call side, even though the company has been beaten up. Uh, in my opinion, uh, I'm not really concerned about the revenue. As you see, they beat more than not. I think it's it's the widening losses here, and again, the, the big negative drops in things like the operating margin and the gross margin. Uh, I think I think that, in my opinion, is, is what is hindering the, the growth here of this company. And um, again, moving forward, they're basically forecasting kind of this flatness moving forward for the next couple of quarters. Let's switch over here to the technical side. So as of right now, the company appears to be kind of in this like rising consolidation zone. Obviously, I drew out a lot of trend lines, so I know it could get confusing. But if I back out here for the one year, we can see we recently rallied up and hit this trend line. And what I did was I connected the tops, as you see, going back to the top of this candle here, June 20th, 2023, coming down, connecting to the tops that we hit just about last week here on March 5th, 2024. So, in my opinion, we could obviously reapproach this trend line here, looking like a little over eight and three quarters, and then potentially break out to the fib and the higher trend line here of, we'll call it about nine and a half. However, it did have two big red days, and now we're in this upward consolidating channel. So, it, you know, it might not be perfect forming, but it does potentially look like we have our pole with our potential flag, which could 
bring us back down into this range that we've been in for quite some time. If we back up here, technically the company on the longer side, on the on the longer time, well, not really longer time, this is only going back uh, about a year. But as you see here, going back March 23rd of 2023, you can see the low at the top of the screen, 626. And then if we connect it to that low there, November 1st, 23, you can see the low 630. And then it doesn't quite meet up with that low on February 12th, 24, as you see low 635. So technically, you could make the argument, well, we've kind of slightly been making these higher lows. Yes, but also at the same time, we haven't been making higher highs. And even though we were for a couple of months, we immediately pulled back and made a new low. And of course, if we pull back over time, we can see that the stock has basically been in a downtrend since uh, the height there in September of 2021. However, it, it looks like if we go back over the years, every time the company has a big dip down, it does have a nice rebound. So if they do beat it up and bring it back down to this, like all time, I don't, is it all time? That's technically not all time, but it goes back to the bottom there, February 24th, 03. And you can see they beat it up, they brought it down, and then it had a massive explosion, right? And even here, it doesn't come back to this trend line, of course, but you can see they sell it off and they chunk it down hard, and then it has a massive rally and, and explodes back up to where it was. Here we have a big sell-off here in 2015, and then we rally and go back to where we were. And then we have the dip again, 2020, we know there was a lot going on, and the stock rebounds and explodes and basically gets back to where it was and now we're dropping down again and we could potentially hit this support trend line and then rally and go back kind of to where we were so anything can happen but i just wanted to show this one support line here that we are kind of close to and again that was uh back at the bottoms there february 03 and the bottom during pandemic about the third week of march right there 2020 so now, yeah, that is the bottom. Yeah, so that's off screen. But we're in this downward, kind of looks like a downward trumpet. However, technically, even though we didn't make the same bottoms, we are almost essentially at a flat line bottom here, going back to, again, March 23rd of 23. And now again, we have we have our tops coming down. So of course, again, anything can happen. We could pop out here because we have earnings coming up again. So it you know might throw might throw a wrench into our into our gear machine of technical analysis here, and we might have to reevaluate the situation. However, we could potentially stay in this range and come back down here into the sixes. And in my opinion. If they do happen to post a wider than expected loss and Wall Street beats them up again and brings them down here again, as you can see, this next trend line looking like about the low sevens. And in my opinion, I think if that happens and the stock reacts negatively after these earnings and it goes down, I think that, again, I'm predicting, but I think in my opinion that it may chunk down and kind of stay in this range and then that may potentially uh, form a descending triangle, which will have it break the range and chunk down even further. I know it's off screen, so if we come back down here again, you're looking at about like 630. And then if we break down this longer term support, again, going back to the lows in uh, 2000 it was, or 2003, whatever. But as you can see, now we're going to drop into the low fives potentially down here at this trend line. However, again, our top resistance trend line here, this is the, looks like the high September 24th, 21, connecting to the top of December 7th, 21, and just cutting down and going across. And again, I drew some trend lines from the other tops as well, but technically this line here is your long-term resistance trend line going back from the tops in September of 21. So that's why we could potentially see maybe like a 10, 12% pop here if the company comes out with some decent numbers and we could break up above these uh, these trend lines here, get to this FIB 929 and then potentially try to 
test and break above this resistance trend line here again as you see maybe sitting right around nine and a half the high 940s so just trying to show what could potentially happen if the stock goes up a little bit and what could potentially happen if if we happen to have another rough quarter and the stock could go down but uh obviously it, it does seem like if we go down it could really drop and and, and we could take a quick 30 40 percent haircut real real quick here in my opinion uh but and not only again does the company have mixed earnings that it has to try to get in line but also again they've recently just been cut to junk and um there was an issue bear with me here yeah they had a mine as you see, Brascom agreed to reimburse $347 million in damages over its rock salt mine in, oh, my apologies to all Brazilians. I want to say, ma, 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 Maceio? Maceio? My apologies. Contrary to the earlier stated, $203 million. So, the company was aware i feel that it agreed to reimburse these damages and as you see earlier stated 203 now they agreed to reimburse 347 million so that's about 75 percent more than the than the original number uh on it fell four percent losing 119 million shareholder value investors may have grounds to suspect brascom of hiding the real situation over the mine well that's not good news Entered in an agreement for the payment, full reimbursement, rock sold mine. Mm hmm. Yeah. So apparently there was also an article that said that the mine basically made the whole area like uninhabitable as well. So they had to, that's what the damages are as well. You had to like pay for, to relocate all of these citizens. Federal police have served, have served judicial search and seizure warrants involving members and former members. The company's plant in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Company said is at the disposal, of course. Shares were up. Launch raids, yep, sinking ground, which has forced about 60,000 people to move since 2018. 30 salt mines under the coastal city of nearly 1 million people. Part of the mine collapsed. Uh, 19 operations hold after authorities said they contributed to five neighborhoods sinking, making the area, quote, uninhabitable. So, unfortunately, we know that these things could happen. And, of course, it's usually negative for the company. Uh, but as we see here, quote, evidence was found that the mining activities did not follow the safety parameters set out in the scientific literature and in the respective mining plans. Furthermore, signs were identified that false data was presented and relevant information omitted from public bodies responsible for monitoring the activities. So, yeah, it's situations like this that basically when there are people who read the headlines who might not even understand how the market works. And they can kind of put two and two together and see that, yeah, this may be a real crappy moment for the stock. And chances are it's probably going to start dropping down. And as we see, it has been dropping for quite some time. And again, regardless of whether this is because margin percentages have decreased or, uh, again, losses have been widening, it's, I think, in my opinion, it is just a mixture of everything. The, the, the assets making a little bit of a rebound, but now basically being back to where they were 18 months ago, while the liabilities jumped up, the equity, as we looked, is now sub $1 billion. The book value used to be above $6 a share. Now it's down to two fifty. The debt has been running up the last couple of quarters, taking about a $700 million jump last quarter from, uh, what, about $10.7 billion up to $11.43 billion, I believe it was. Uh, we have Q1 and last quarter Q3 of 2023. We had that negative cash flow, right? Chunked down to over minus 700 million, even though the company does have some cash on hand. But 
you know, it, it was, it, it, it's still obviously operating and trying to do a couple of things, as you see here, Shell and Brascom collab on biocircular uh, propylene fee stocks. So this is why I'm saying we know that there's some value here, but, and, and even something like this, you got the S&P and you got Fitch dropping their ratings, cutting them to junk. Quote, after difficult petrochemical industry conditions in 2023, we believe that the rebound in petrochemical spreads will take longer than previously expected. Rating agency added that as a result of this outlook, it expects weaker profitability and consequently higher leverage, more debt, for Brascom until 2025. Uh, Brascom said it was committed to maintaining its liquidity position. Yep, of course. Reduce its corporate leverage, had already lost its investment grade by Fitch, was downgraded deep into junk territory by Moody's, amid new damage claims at the time over sinking ground in the city of Maceo. Um, my apologies again. If you are Brazilian, please do not attack me in the comments. I tried, but basically, unfortunately, again, we're seeing a situation where we have a company that's still bringing in, you know, tens of billions. And right now, the, the stock is only worth about three and a third billion market cap. And the negatives, in my opinion, are just drastically outweighing the positives. And it's unfortunate because I know people find these situations and, and will get excited, you know. Oh, oh my God, like, did, did I just find, you know, the diamond in the rough flying underneath the radar? And this is why, again, I always say you get out what you put in, and this is why you always have to look at everything. Now, if someone out there just liked the stock or it, you know, started trending one day, so you've been watching it, and now that it's down in the eights, you're, you know, taking a shot, rolling the dice, and if earnings come out, boom, it pops to 10. Listen, more power to you. You, you know I'm happy for you if you make a couple of bucks. But again, my point is you really have to make sure you try to get as much information as possible about the company. Look at a lot of these fundamentals because you've seen, um, even when people have some of these stocks trending and everyone's talking about them and people want to talk about the short squeezes, you know, if I, if I look at a company and the fundamentals look weak or they look like they're decreasing, these short squeezes and these random pops that people are hoping and praying for could, of course, happen. And sometimes they do happen. And I do end up being wrong on the situation. However, a lot of these companies that you guys look at, when I see crappy fundamentals and I say, in my opinion, you know, I, I would stay away or I would be like wait and see mode. I would give it some time you see a lot of these companies do seriously chunk down over the weeks and the months after we look at them. So this is why, again, you, you can't just... you can't just buy a stock because it's only $8 a share so you can buy quantity. You understand what I'm saying? You can't look at a situation like this and say, oh, look, in September of 21, it was at, uh, you know, $26, and now it's at 8 It's a buy. No, it's, you know, it, it might not necessarily be a buy. This is why I used to say to you guys all the time, find out the why, right? Find out the why as to the reason why the stock went from those highs, 20 plus, now all the way down to freaking, you know, where this thing hit, $6. And now it's been bouncing around, not going higher than 9 when it used to be 20 plus just a couple of years ago. So what's going on with this company? Well, we just kind of looked at a lot of fundamentals. So now we're seeing a better picture as to what's going on with the company. Uh, we do have these pops and drops. As you can see, we, we have these trumpeting of the Bollinger Bands, and then we tighten up here with these little consolidated ranges, ranges, and then we pop, and we trumpet again, and we have the tightening, and then we pop, and we trumpet again, and now we have tightening. And again, we have earnings coming up uh, Monday, and we can see for the last couple of days, the stock has actually technically looked pretty sound, even though, uh, again, I mentioned the big drop and the potential flag forming that could break us back down down to sub eight. Uh, I will say uh, here, looking at stock charts, the stock has approached the mid Bollinger band multiple times and every time has bounced off of it and not breaking, not broken below it, except of course this slight break, but then it went up and it closed basically right at the, the mid Bollinger band. So in my opinion, it technically looks like it's trending up. And again, we're up two and a half percent here right now. And we have earnings Monday after the close. So we might have we might be up a little bit more here, maybe to this 200-day moving average, 871 going into earnings. 
And then that's why, again, if they beat, maybe up to like that nine and a half mark, depending on what they report and what they forecast moving forward. Or again, if they miss, we could potentially uh, break out down, break down out of this uh, upward channel here and we could come back down into the sevens. I'm not sure exactly how much they might beat it up, but again, I showed a, a couple of trend lines and a couple of potential patterns I'm watching on the chart. So we could really get ugly here, depending on what the company says. And as you see, again, it's not even me beating up the stock, right? Because we can see even lately, right? They, they beat the stock up down into the sixes and then boom, we run back up basically to where we are here about that eight and a half, nine level. And then boom, they beat the stock up again and bring it down to the, to the sixes. And then, yeah, we rally back up to the nines and then boom, they beat the stock up again, right? So if we keep doing this seesaw mode, well, past performance doesn't dictate future results. However, um, we're on the uptrend here. And that's why I'm saying if these numbers are bad, then we're going to beat them up and probably bring them back down here to the sixes again. You understand? So, of course, anything can happen because we do have earnings coming out Monday. But in my opinion, overall, I, I would be in wait and see mode. I would not. This does not strike me as a, as a situation I, I have to be a part of with these earnings coming up. But, you know, granted, I'm sure some of you own shares for quite some time or you've been looking at it. So that's why I wanted to take a look at it. And again, it seems like a necessary business. And I know that, hold on, I was looking at the control here. One second. Looking at what Petrobras said recently. Uh, Petrobras wants to share management of Brasco. Brazil's state-run oil company, Petrobras, right, nationalization, wants a partner to share the management of petrochemical producer Brascom. Uh, Brascom is controlled by Novanor, formerly known as Odebrecht. In November, Abu Dhabi Oil Company presented an offer to buy Novanor's stake. Petrobras, however, could use preference rights to buy Novanor's stake. Take along. Those are not the preferred outcomes. Quote, the intention is clearly to not exercise the preference rights. It is really to have a partner that we can work together with. Petrobras holds 36.1% of Brascom's total capital and 47% of its voting capital, while Novanor holds 38.3% of total capital and 50.1% of voting capital. So of the voting capital, 97% is owned by these two entities. And of the total capital, we're at almost 74.5%. So th this is why, again, in my opinion, I, I personally would stay away from these companies in the past. Because as you see, it's, I, I feel like you're just really, not, you're just not in control. And, you know, this is why a lot of our domestic stocks... Uh, over time, you know, compoundly grow significantly better than, you know, something like a uh, Brazilian petrochemical company, unfortunately. But Brascom Q4 sales, resin sales, Brazil down 9% year over year. Uh, average petrochemical plant utilization rate in Brazil is 66% down 6 Q4 sales volume, main petrochemical products in Brazil down 15% year over year. Sales of polypropylene in the US, Europe down 1%. That's not a big drop. Q4 sales volume of polyethylene in Mexico stable year over year. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. In, in my opinion, I really do feel like the negatives outweigh the positives here. And we do, again, have a potential MACD curling and crossing here. We we're, have a nice pop here today over 2%. We could potentially see another 2 3% on Monday going into the earnings. So that could cross and maybe actually force the stock up here to the high 8s, potentially low 9s even. But again, if it's, if it's been holding and, and rallying up this whole time and then they come out and, like I said, report a wider than expected loss or they miss on revenue or they forecast that it's going to get, it's going to stay, you know, rough before it gets better for the next couple of quarters, then in my opinion, I think they're going to tank it back down into the 7s and eventually the 6s. But only time will tell. Uh, could possibly do an update maybe Monday. Uh, later afternoon after market close when we get these numbers 
RSI here a little over 59 on the daily, right? It's been bouncing nicely off the mid-Bollinger Band, so the RSI is climbing up. It does look like, minus this drop here below our 30 benchmark on the RSI, it does look like even here, when it dipped down, you had that bump up. And as we began to rally here, uh, you know, no, not really. Here we hit that 70 benchmark, and then we began to sell off. As we approached that 30 benchmark, we had a little bit of a pop. So we could make the argument that this is a trader stock here, and we have a lot of people just watching the RSI and kind of buying these pops and these drops. As you see here, hits about the 70 benchmark and then begins to pull back and sell off. But I think because earnings came up, I think it stopped right there midway, hit the mid-Bollinger Band, and has been trying to stay up ever since. Let's check the weekly. RSI sitting here at about 52 and a third. We're seeing multiple rejections for several, several months off of the 50-day moving average. Because again, in my opinion, I just feel like the whole situation is more negative than positive. So I personally kind of agree with this. I'm not seeing a good reason why to, to keep it above the moving average and, and have it run up. Aside from the one fact that they bring in, you know, whatever, $14 billion, and the market cap's $3 billion and change. That, that really, in my opinion, is one of the few arguments that you can make here. But you can see up over 6% this week. And... Yeah, I, I, have, a fe I have a feeling this is going to go down. Again, I'm not, you know, wishing any negativity on you guys but i just feel like this is a rocky situation here and and like i said like i like i always say in in my opinion i'd rather be patient and have that wait and see mode and let the company prove me wrong right let them report uh those eps losses in line with what analysts were expecting instead of wider like they've been doing for the most part let them potentially come in a chunk above revenue estimates again like they did last quarter coming in 13 percent above those estimates if they're able to come in five seven eight percent above this estimate now this quarter again right now we're potentially seeing a little bit of a different picture and we could potentially be near our bottom about to make our u-turn recovery and we could you know after this quarter slowly tick up for the next couple of months back up to this 200 day moving average of you know 12 and change so that's why, in my opinion, I would be wait and see mode. But Brascom, ticker symbol BAK here on the New York Stock Exchange for us here in the States, in my opinion, again, I would stay away from, I would remain patient. But I'm going to end it there. So once again, this is Stocks by the Numbers. I want to thank you guys for stopping by. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, drop it down in the comments section. I'm usually very quick to reply. Thumbs up algorithm helps me get more eyes on the channel. And of course, subscribe to the channel. That is our handshake agreement. That is how you help me help you. But more importantly, moving forward, like I always say, I understand that markets are rocky and they're volatile and they're very uncertain. So I do want to wish all of you success. I hope everyone makes a couple of dollars. Thanks for stopping by. Have a good weekend.